Good afternoon to everybody, and thank you so much for inviting me here today to talk about offshore wind success in Denmark. Many of you will know a shipping company called Maersk, dealing with containers all over the world. Uh, all the ships for Maersk used to be built in Denmark. That's not the case anymore. We lost that industry to Korea, so we should be sad and crying. In fact, we are not crying because in the meantime, we have developed a new industry, the offshore wind. In the old shipyards today, more people are employed uh, in uh, uh, making turbines, blades, and so on, towers for the wind industry. So today I'm going to talk about what could be the next industry for Korea, a potential for lots of jobs, something that will be greening the world and that will be very important for all of us. But before we get started, I should also just give you a picture of what happened in Denmark over time. You know, when you look at this picture, it starts from 1990. It's all dark. Uh, it was fossil fuel we used in Denmark for energy consumption. And only from 1990 and onwards, we started to develop the green renewable energy. As of 2020, we are about 70% of our electricity that comes from renewable energy. Half of that, or about close to 50%, is from wind turbines. And in 2028, we expect that 100% of our electricity will be from renewable energy. We are seeing companies moving to Denmark, the RE100 companies wanting to buy the Danish renewable energy because they want to produce with fully green energy. We will not be stopping there. So um, I can tell you that we are progressing with our first energy islands. I will come back to that. We want to go far beyond what we need ourselves to sell it and to produce hydrogen. Another interesting story is that we often hear uh, it's not possible to transform the energy sector. It takes too long, it's too difficult, you can only have a little percentage of renewable energy. In Denmark, we transformed our electricity sector in, in just over 10 years. It was done by Ørsted, the Danish KEPCO. Uh, they decided to move from black to green, and in 2007, 84% <coughs> of the energy uh, produced by them was fossil fuel uh, or electricity. Today, 94% is, you know, renewable energy. So our KEPCO in Denmark did it in just over 10 years. So it is doable. It's just getting out there. And what happened for the company? It's the second largest company in Denmark now. And it's a world leader with more than 30% of development of offshore wind in the world. <coughs> so as a strong industry has been developed and uh, lots of jobs involved in that as well. The next story is about, I could say, my hometown. It's very close to where I was born, a port called Isberg. When I was a boy, it used to be a place with eight to 900 shipping boats. Uh, only ship, uh, fishermen uh, were working in that harbor and, and fishing from that place. In the meantime, many of them lost their jobs because fishing ships became bigger and bigger and they have now uh, catching the fish in the ocean. But what happened is that we developed oil and gas. Uh, not many know, but Denmark is the biggest producer of oil and gas in uh, EU uh, after UK left. So we saw this picture in the middle, lots of oil and gas industry in the 70s and onwards. And lately, in the last 20 years, it has picked up to be the leading port in Europe for installation of offshore wind and um, jobs are just keep on increasing in that sector. To give you a little insight into this, if you look on the left-hand side here, you will see a map of Europe. On the very left, you have UK. Then you have Denmark as a peninsula sticking up and top from Germany and Netherlands. And then you will see many small red dots. These 55 small red dots are projects, offshore wind projects, where the harbor of Isberg has been involved in installation. So you can imagine one port developing the expertise, being the first mover 
gets out there and get, gets a lot of uh, job opportunities. If you look at the right hand side, you have seen the steady growth of numbers of gigawatts of offshore wind. Take the number from 2018, it says 18 gigawatt in total, of which 55% has been installed or done from Isberg port. If you look into the future, the next 10 years from now, we expect to get close to 100 gigawatt. So you can imagine if Isberg is still is going to do 50% of that, you have to enlarge the harbor area by four or five uh, times what we have today. This is a picture on offshore wind in Europe. I will come back with more figures in a minute to show how big it's going to be. Uh, honestly, we believe that in the future we will have the power stations at sea. There will be no more pollution from coal-fired power plants on land. We can all breathe and do not need to wear masks and so on. Giving a little picture of the, what it has meant for the job opportunities in the, my hometown, Isberg, you could say. Looking back 30, 40 years, everybody was employed in the fishing industry. And uh, of course, nobody imagined that we would become an oil producing country that happened in the 70s and 80s and onwards. But Denmark has just signed up to absolutely stopping all gas and oil exploration from 2050. It is on the decline already, but in not too many years from now, we will actually stop producing oil and gas and we will rely 100% on renewable energy. You can see here that oil and gas is the highest uh, number of jobs right now. Wind energy picked up. These figures are a bit old. They're from 2016 and 17. So a lot has changed just in three or four years. But we can see that energy systems and offshore wind increasing in numbers. This town is not big. It's only 60,000 jobs. Uh, but 25% now in, in, uh, are, are working in this energy sector, you could say. And honestly, the fishermen were maybe unhappy in the beginning, but they are not anymore. They are doing the operation and maintenance of the offshore wind, so they are still sailing on boats and having good jobs and good income. Um, and we can maybe do that during the discussions as well on what actually make people happy and what uh, give the local acceptance. Because definitely in Isberg, there's a lot of local acceptance to the development that is ongoing. Now, perhaps just a word on uh, energy islands. In Denmark, we have decided to build two energy islands. One on the east side of Denmark, just south of Sweden, is a big island called Bornholm. And the other one is on the, in, the west, uh, in the North Sea, 80 kilometers away from, uh, from shore. That one is going to be an artificial island because we have no islands out there. But there's some shallow ground where we can build an artificial island. And we imagine that that island will have 10 gigawatts, up to 10 gigawatts of wind turbines uh, connected. And these turbines will then be linked to UK, Germany, Netherlands, Denmark, and Norway. And they will put, send off the electricity to these countries. And when there's too much production, we will turn the over, ex, ex, extra production into hydrogen. And we will have fuel for the Korean cars that are being built for hydrogen already. So this is the idea about uh, Energy Island uh, from Denmark. And um, we think it's going to be the future uh, because we have the space. And maybe it was just to imagine the size. When the first offshore wind park was built in Denmark 30 years ago, uh, the size was less than half a gigawatt, uh, half, half a megawatt, sorry. Less, it was 450 uh, something. Now, next year, Vestas is going to test 15 megawatt turbine. So you can imagine if you take 10 of these big turbines, you have a small power station of 150 megawatt. Uh, it's so different from what it used to be. We're talking about scale now. If you look a little bit about Europe, what's happening in Europe, <clears throat> you see again UK to the left, Germany and, and England and uh, Germany and Netherlands and Denmark attached as a peninsula on top of that. You see our energy island that I just spoke about up to 10 gigawatt in the center. Um, but in UK they're planning to go from 10 gigawatt to 30 gigawatt extra in 10 years from now. 
In Netherlands, they're planning to build from 2.5 up to 11 gigawatts. In Germany, they want to extend from 5 to 20. So we're looking into a picture with a lot of uh, new builds in that area, a lot of steel, a lot of turbines, a lot of blades to be built, a lot of installation ships will be required and so on. So uh, whoever gets out there first is, will be able to grab a good part of that industry and be involved in it, and that goes for Asia as well. <clears throat> Looking at some of the figures, most of this has happened in Denmark in the last 20 years. So now we talk about um, uh, jobs created in the Green Technology Center in Denmark. There used to be zero. Now 60% of our uh, people employed in the industry is working in this green technology uh, uh, sector. And a few years back, it was 11% of our export. I think today it's 12 or 13. So we have created a new export sector. I mentioned before we lost the shipbuilding industry, but we have developed the offshore wind sector industry as a new sector. It has been growing 60%. In the, since 2010, and honestly, the same could be done in Korea. Korea can be the world leader in Asia for installing uh, uh, offshore wind. On the right-hand side, you will see some figures in terms of jobs creation. It's Stanford University and Berkeley University saying that more than a million jobs can be created in Korea if you turn to green renewable energy, and a lot of that will be in relate to uh, construction and renewable energy. Uh, and some uh, maintenance as well. This picture here is the picture, uh, what do you have in Korea right now? I think Korea is very fortunate to have a very well-developed supply chain because what you need is basically these six boxes you see here. Uh, you need good product development, you have good product developers, and if you combine them with some of the developers in Denmark that have 30 years of experience in doing precisely this, you will be on top of it. Wind turbines, you also have wind turbine makers. We have wind turbine makers. Unfortunately, the Danish wind turbine makers has been around for many, many years and has developed very high, high end product, you could say. So maybe there's scope for com, you know, working closely together there. On cables, you are cutting edge. You are already, many of the offshore wind farms in built in the world is using LS cables, you know, cables and uh, systems. On uh, substations, you are excellent, you can build it, you can basically build anything with steel in this country. You're good at designing it, you're good at getting it done. The same goes for foundation and towers. On the south coast of, um, of uh, Korea, uh, Samkang has just produced 150, you know, uh, foundations for Taiwan. That's for big, huge turbines in Taiwan. Uh, so no problems with foundations or towers. You can even learn to do the floating uh, foundations that will be needed out from Ulsan, down with Jeju and so on, and for the world. And installations. Korea is very good at building ships. You're already building some of these installation ships. So you have an excellent supply chain. And if you combine it with the best knowledge from abroad, you can be the leader in Asia and in the world as such. Just two words on level of levelized cost of energy. We always hear uh, renewable energy is too costly, and it is costly in the beginning. Um, on the left-hand side here, you see these are estimated costs from uh, projects in Incheon, South Jelala, Jeju, and Ulsan. Uh, 75. Uh, euro per megawatt hour if you go into partnership and 90 euro if you do it alone. If you do everything from Korean uh, supply chain and not take knowledge of the best from outside, then it will be more costly or you can turn it around and say you can save 22% if you find the right partnerships. If you look at the right hand side in the corner, the top corner over here, you will see the gray line. That's the price we pay in Europe right now. 50 euro uh, is about the price for, for megawatt hour, and that will go down to uh, 40, 35 uh, in the years to come. Korea is still 
early days for supply chain, so it will take a little bit of time to go down, but you will get there as well. If you look at the bottom box below, there are some estimates of job creation. And for every half a gigawatt or 500 megawatt you develop or, or, or build in Korea, you will at least have 15,000 jobs. And in some cases, if you build out from Ulsan with a very, you know, a uh, lot of steel required for floating foundations, you might have as many as 30,000 jobs per half a gigawatt. I'm coming to my second last slide to round up. And uh, the one I'm going to show you here is just a little bit about scope and size. I liked what the professor said about before about population and cities and so on. And if you look into this scope here, many people believe we will have 230 to 450 gigawatt of offshore wind in Europe. That's to cater for the climate uh, goals we uh, want to achieve. 180 of these gigawatts will be in the North Sea, and they could be connected to 10 to 15 energy islands like the one Denmark is building now. If you look to Asia, People have estimated that the needs are 600 gigawatts, also connected to energy islands. And I guess this is big business. Whoever comes out there first with a full supply chain and uh, able to do this, uh, it's, it's a great possibility. And I think Korea can do it, uh, definitely. We have several studies from the Danish side that show the cost of energy. When you do partnership, you go further. We have started the ports in Korea, which ports could be eligible, Ulsan, Busan, Mokpo, Gunsan, and so on. We have a, a publication on black to green. How did we transform in just 10 years? And it is possible. So I just want to finish and say, if you do this clever and you do it fast, you will be the leader in Asia in installing the future energy supply at sea. And of course, we would like to be your partner in this and share our knowledge on this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.